major funding was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Edward Wisner Donation Fund. The Edward Wisner Donation, through the City of New Orleans, funds cultural, educational, environmental, and health-related nonprofits in Orleans Parish. And the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation. Whitney Bank. Bell South, the Gold Ring Family Foundation, the T.G. Solomon Families, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana, Louisiana State University, and by When I tell people my grandmother lives in the French Quarter of New Orleans, their first question is usually, and what does your grandmother do? Her name is Lindy Boggs, and she was the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress from Louisiana. I grew up with her in Washington, D.C. while she was serving in Congress there. But many of my happiest childhood memories are the summers I spent with her down in New Orleans. Other kids went to summer camp, I went on the campaign trail. Sometimes when I walk through the quarter with her, I still feel like we're on the campaign trail, even though she officially retired years ago. This is my granddaughter. Hello, granddaughter. Hi, nice to see you. How are you? Rebecca. I had the privilege of meeting you a few years ago when you were the ambassador in Italy. I was with Although you'd never know it, my grandmother's 90. She's seen this country go through dramatic changes, and she's been a key player in many of them. When I was little, I loved to have her tell me stories. In fact, all the women in my family are great storytellers. My mom, Koki, has made a career of it. Now it's time for us to tell the story of Lindy's life. I stand on this podium tonight, not only as a Democrat, our member of the House of Representatives, but as a woman. For women in politics, Lindy Boggs is our matriarch. She's the matriarch of America. Hale and Lindy Boggs form one of the most remarkable partnerships in American political history by getting people's minds, for a while anyway, and it was awfully hard, off the subject of race and on to common problems. That our hope for prosperity is in the protection of the poor and the elderly. We know we are right, and the American people know we are right. She was always doing the right thing. So it's not a matter of saying, can you be with us on this issue? She was already there. She was born at a time when women were not supposed to speak up, when women were not supposed to lead. And here, at a moment of great tragedy and sadness, she stepped into a role as a leader. American women need the Equal Rights Amendment as a guarantee that the deep, traditional, systematic, and pervasive discrimination that has bred them will be eliminated. Lindy also, for all of her wonderful manners and charm, was a very determined lady. And uh, all you had to do was come up against something that Lindy believed very strongly in, to realize there was an awful lot of steel behind that velvet. Lindy was born and raised in the Louisiana countryside in Point Capi Parish. Her ties to this land are still very strong. My grandmother and I took a trip up here to revisit her early life and to learn more about our family history. I brought along my baby, Roland, named after my grandmother's father. Okay, Roland, come visit all your family. That's right. This is your namesake, Roland. Your great great grandfather, <laughs> Roland P. Claybrook, Grandpapa. Hi, love.
pretty. Oh, it's gorgeous. Just gorgeous. This this is reminiscent of my grandmother's house. My Cleveland grandparents' house in New Roads was uh, had parterres like this, mm -hmm. that, that right outside of the houses would be the formal gardens, mm -hmm. and oftentimes beautiful old trees. She grew up around here. What was that like? Oh, it was heavenly growing up on plantations. Everybody loved you and and took care of you and entertained you and fed you, <laughs> and of course you had the cook, and there was the butler, and there was the maid, and of course out on the plantation itself you had overseers. When she was born in 1916, the plantation was still run by the descendants of African slaves. So this was a, uh, a background and circumstance that was genuinely historic and southern. My grandmother was raised in a world that doesn't exist anymore. She was born on her grandfather's sugar plantation. Other relatives owned sugar and cotton plantations for miles around. Tradition ruled the rhythm of daily life. Women did not yet have the right to vote, and African Americans had almost no political rights at all. Aunt Hannah Hall was my mammy. You know, she was like another grandmother to me. And I, of course, loved her very much. I obeyed her very carefully. <laughs> and uh, I still think of different things that Aunt Hannah told me from time to time. This was the way that, that I was so reared. Come on. as tough as they come. She is tough in all the right ways. She's tough-minded. Uh, she, uh, she is tough in the sense that she has had to take all kinds of blows and gotten up from them. My mother's father died when she was a baby, and her grandfather died when she was six or seven, and that was a big blow to her. He was a real presence in her life. Her family home burned down, and she went to a convent boarding school as a very young child. I came to the convent here when I was nine, and boarded during the week and went home on the weekends. I had a glorious education across the board in music and art and literature and history. And everything that you can possibly think of. What influence did the sisters have in your life? I, I thought that women did, did everything. There was nothing that they didn't do. And it didn't occur to me that women didn't do everything. Social justice was probably the linchpin of all of their moral training with us. Um, and it was it was very, very meaningful uh, to me as well, and stayed with me all the days of my life. You ended up at Newcomb College when you were only 15. Is that because the nuns had prepared you so well? Well, they, they kept advancing me from one class to another. And then I had the problem that the dean of Newcomb College had a very strict rule that you could not enter until you were 16. And I loved Mr. Shakespeare. And when I was having my interview with Dean Butler, he said, Miss Claiborne, are you 16 years of age? And I thought, well, he's not going to let me in anyway. So I said, to be or not to be, that is the question. But to thine own self be true. Thou canst not then be false to any man. No, sir, I'm not 16. 
Well, Shakespeare got me into Newcomb. <laughs> so tell me how you and Papa met. We met at a Beta Theta Pi dance. He was not a very good dancer. <laughs> but he said to me, and I'm sure it was his line for every girl he danced with, you know, I'm going to marry you someday. And I started looking around for somebody to hurry up and break. Who is this crazy boy? <laughs> and that's the way we met. Is it true that one of the advantages to marrying him was that he swore he'd never go into politics? That's right. <laughs> oh, he wasn't going to be involved in politics. realize that Lindy Boggs came of age politically in the world that Huey Long made is significant. Louisiana politics was lurid, was blatantly corrupt. It was, it was a corruption on a scale that puts petty corruption to shame. Huey Long was a master practitioner of strong-arm politics. Now, a lot of people in the state loved him for the benefits that he showered on the people. You've got a state where politicians had promised little and done less for a long, long time, and then came Huey Long, who promised a lot and delivered on a great deal of it, but subverting the democratic process. The president of the state university went to jail, and several other people went to jail, and finally the governor went to jail. And there was nobody left, really, to lead a, a, a political movement except the women and the young people. The young people, with Hale as their leader, formed something called the People's League. My classmate and good friend was Hale Boggs. And we were amazed at the corruption in the courts in the administration. The corruption went in the police department. They all were being paid off. I had threats on my life, and uh, Hale did too. My first child was born, got threatened. I wouldn't tell my wife Hale. I don't know if he even told me, I'm sure he did. Uh, many times during uh, those early years, it was very serious. I was 22 or so, and it was the first election in which I could vote. And when they came to me and asked me if I would be the precinct captain of the 5th precinct of the 12th ward, I said, if that's what you really want me to do, but I thought the police did all of that. Women hesitated to go to the polls in the 1930s without a male escort. As strange as that might seem, there was drinking, there was some pretty coarse language. It's no place for a lady, many people thought. She also knows that there are tactics that people practice sometimes that involve some pretty crude stunts. A bottle of ink is poured into the ballot box to spoil all the ballots. Somebody turns out the lights, and meanwhile a couple of ballot boxes disappear out the back door. So it was really important for women to volunteer to be poll commissioners or poll watchers. And the women who did this took it very seriously. And Lindy Boggs was part of this. It was about throwing the rascals out and, and putting good government in. I have a wonderful job to perform. I have something here to give to my campaign coordinator, a lady that I've known for a good many years, well and favorably, and for whom I have a very deep affection. She worked hard in this campaign and anybody else, and Lindy, this is for you from me. In 1940, my grandfather was elected to Congress. He was only 26 years old, the House's youngest representative. Lindy was soon a busy young mother of three, my Aunt Barbara, my Uncle Tommy, and my mother Corrine, better known as Cokie. Lindy ran the family's homes in Washington and New Orleans, but she was far from a typical housewife of her era. 
She also ran my grandfather's office, his campaigns, and was a vital partner in shaping their political ideals. I was very fortunate because Hale brought me into his political life. I, I was enthusiastic about it to begin with, and he made certain that he fed my enthusiasm constantly. Hale and Lindy Boggs form one of the most uh, remarkable partnerships in American political history. They were maybe the, the, the Franklin and Eleanor of congressional couples. Starting in the late 1940s, continuing into the 1950s, Hale and Lindy Boggs, and you have to talk about them together. You cannot talk about one without talking about the other. They broadened their electoral base, first of all by uh, including many African-American voters who were being enfranchised for the first time, but then also white blue-collar workers and union members. They moved way beyond that simply that good government base to talk about social and economic reform and eventually about racial justice, and that's why they stand out. Those who try to separate us from our neighbors do no service to the people of the state of Louisiana. We crossed over that bridge when we rejected the Articles of Confederation because we look upon one another as fellow Americans, regardless of where we may come from or regardless of our race, our creed, or the color of our skin. For Hale Boggs, a lot of his former cohorts just wanted to cut him off completely. That's for Lindy played a key role. She helped protect him from the powers that be because she came from this very distinguished family. She commanded much more kind of influence and respect and she was willing to lend it to her husband and help foster his career. Well what was it like for you to hear people say mean things about him? Well of course you hate to hear anything mean said about, about your husband or anybody that, whom you love. You felt very badly about some of your own family members, some of your social friends, not understanding. It was a, a very divisive time, certainly in your social life. When I was growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s, my uh, folks would tell me when I asked about segregation and racial discrimination, so that's the way it is, don't get in trouble, don't get in the way. I got in the way. And I think long before I got in the way, Lindy got in the way. These were hard times for my family, especially the year the Klan burned a cross in front of their home. We were in danger. Uh, there were death threats. It was, uh, the phone was tapped. Um, Mama used to put us on the phone to do our math um, so that people would be bored to death listening. Uh, but there was one day we came home and there were people under the house. It was scary and it was very hard on Mama. One looks back at the time and can only think uh, how courageous this was. Uh, this was not uh, the politics of opportunity. This was the politics of challenge and great risk and re requiring great courage. I've seen some of the ads that were run against Hale when he was running for re-election to Congress, and they were, had very heavy racial overtones, and, and he was pictured as uh, virtually a communist. I mean, there was this deliberate and edged attack on him and on her as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here with you this evening. As you can see, this is a, genuinely a family program. Lindy here has managed my campaign for about the tenth time. Oh. Tell a little bit about the campaign. Well, this it has occurred at a time in the history of our district and our state and, and our nation where we, we really need the dedicated interest of all truly good Americans. God bless you for saying that, Lindy. I've seen some of the uh, campaign propaganda being distributed, and I say to myself, can this be America? I just can't believe it. I'm very happy that I don't have the John Bates Society, the Ku Klux Klan, the Communist Party supporting me. I don't want them. Glad not to have them. Remember, the longer a good man serves, 
the more good he can render to his people and his state. My grandfather won that election and many subsequent ones. His star was ascending in the National Democratic Party. During the legislative season, my grandparents lived here, in this house in the Washington suburbs. My parents now live in that same house. They're both journalists and keepers of the family history. One of the things that people forget was that Lindy was a major political advisor to Hale all through his years in Congress. And she wasn't just a figurehead or a pretty face standing by his side. She was the political brains behind that outfit. My mother organized everything, everybody, and the whole community as well as all of us. I could never get over it. Of course, I was married, as you were, here in this yard, and um, there were 1,500 people at my wedding. She cooked for the 1,500 people, and uh, I love the image that I will forever have. My mother was making the pickles, soothing the baby, and had the phone crooked under her chin, into which she was dictating a speech. Lindy Boggs was as influential as a national player during the 50s and 60s as she was when she was a member of Congress in her own right. She formed a wide circle of acquaintances that gave Pale Boggs entree to the highest levels in politics and government. And this kind of networking that women were involved in really helped make politics work. And this is something that scholars just simply have ignored. Well, Hale himself was a spectacular personality. He was a big, hearty, um, manly, masculine guy who had a sort of a florid Southern political style, who sometimes, I think, occasionally bruised some feelings, as strong personalities sometimes do. Hale would, if, if he needed a vote, uh, he'd break off your arm and club you to death with it to get that vote. But Lindy would just walk up to you and say, darling, you know, blah, 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 and next thing you know, she got it. You know that? Uh, that, and, and that's how effective she was. I mean, she was unbelievably effective. The Johnson and Boggs families were very close, but it was Lindy and Lady Bird Johnson who initially forged that relationship, which allowed Hale Boggs to be a key player in, uh, in the passage of a lot of great society legislation. Neither Hale nor Lyndon uh, thought that they could do the job they needed to do without Lindy and Lady Bird. They knew who their best assets were. Mother and Lindy did miracles on the whistle stop train going through the South. It was a railroad campaign through the South, and I was part of that advance to the there was always an enormous crowd when the Lady Bird Special came through. And we were fairly successful, so much so that four years later, we went back down, reactivated the groups, and got Head Start programs commenced in those communities. By the mid-1960s, race relations were in upheaval across the country, and tensions were flaring, especially in the South. As a Southern Democrat, my grandfather was caught in the middle. Many of his white Louisiana constituents were staunch segregationists. Many national leaders, on the other hand, were finally backing civil rights. This is a speech my grandfather gave down in Louisiana shortly after Martin Luther King's historic march on Washington. Now in Washington yesterday, they had a great demonstration. Maybe you're not interested. <laughs> Your life. As a matter of fact, it was probably a great exercise in Americanism. And I say this to you, 
We will not solve these problems by demagoguery, nor by threatening new secession from the Union. I thank God that in the years that I have had the privilege of representing you, that I have never joined any hate group. I feel proud when I listen to the fiery speeches my grandfather gave, but political pressures did take their toll on him. He may not have ever joined any hate groups, but looking back on those days, it's hard for me to understand some of the positions he did take. He supported, for example, and signed on to the infamous Southern Manifesto. 101 members of Congress from the South signed this manifesto in which they condemned the Supreme Court decision outlawing segregation in public schools. This was really a, a green light to ardent segregationists to continue to resist integration. He voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was public accommodations, and it also turned out to be the, the law that got me my job because it was also an end of sex discrimination in hiring. Southern members of Congress were under unbelievable pressure. It was very risky and very dangerous, really, for a Southern white politician to get out front on something like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Even President Johnson, when he signed the act in July 1964, he said, in effect, we may be turning the South over to the Republican for years to come. There was, according to, to several accounts, one exception in that council. There was one of Hale Boggs' close advisors who urged him to vote for the, for the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, whatever the consequences, and that was Lindy Boggs. But in any event, he voted against it. And up to 1964, his black constituents didn't like what he had to do, but they understood that it was probably politically necessary. But after 1964, it gets a little trickier because now uh, African Americans are saying, look, um, uh, we have waited long enough. And so the next big test was uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I remember Hale called me and he asked me, what did I think? I said, well, Hale, I wish that I would have the courage to vote for it. I'm not sure of that. Uh, there's no question it's the right thing to do, but it will be the most difficult vote you ever cast in Congress. And he thought for a minute, he said, oh, to hell with them. <laughs> I'm going to do it. The night before this bill, my grandmother and my mother were visiting in Washington. And these wonderful ladies, including my grandmother, who, of course, was reared by slave nannies. They were all pushing Hale that he had to speak. He wasn't, and he kept saying, now I'm voting for it, and that should satisfy you. So I was so embarrassed that he was not going to speak that I didn't go to the gallery. He kept saying, look, just leave me alone. I'm not going to speak. It would be political suicide to speak on that bill. So we all were very grumpy with him. And uh, then the next day, a fellow Louisianian was on the floor of the House and started to make a speech about how there was no discrimination in Louisiana and that it was easy for, for black people to vote. And it just made Daddy crazy. And so he got up and made a quite wonderful speech. And was it political suicide? It was actually okay in 1966. It was 1968 that was the killer when he voted for the open housing bill. And at that point, various uh, African-American leaders begged him not to vote for the open housing bill because they thought it would defeat him and that he would be defeated by uh, someone who was staunchly segregationist. And he said, and I can remember this so well, he said, I have crossed that Rubicon. 
I am not going back to the other side. On October 16, 1972, my grandfather was in Alaska campaigning for his friend, Congressman Nick Begich. The phone rang with the awful news. The small plane my grandfather was traveling in had disappeared. I was two years old at the time. I got a call from Mother Teresa from New York, and she said she just heard the news. But not to worry, Everywhere she went, everybody would pray for her. I was in California, and I was feeding you all dinner. And um, the phone rang, and it was a good friend of ours calling and saying, Oh, Koki, is there anything I can do? I got on a plane the next morning to come here, and... Um, I came to the house, which was filled with people and food and all that. And Mama said, oh, thank goodness you're here. We're going to Alaska. And I said, are you out of your mind? I couldn't imagine it. Here was the whole support system. And Mama just said very simply, if you were missing in Alaska, he would go to look for you. And we all got onto a military plane in the middle of the night and went to Alaska. First three or four days, it was real hope. You hear all kinds of stories in Alaska about planes disappearing and being found. Uh, the, the possibility of finding them after six or seven or eight days of that kind of intensive search uh, gets less and less. The, the walls were straight up, and, and if the plane went down in there, they would, there was uh, no possibility that, that they could have survived. For the first time in maybe five or six days, Lindy walked off by herself, and then the family started to walk over to her, and I stopped the family. I said, I said let's, just, let's just wait here. So Lindy just went off for about 15 minutes, and uh, she had her private thoughts. You plan to just stay at home now in Washington and wait? Well, I, I will do whatever is required of me, go wherever it's necessary. Have a good Thank trip. you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye bye. My grandfather was never found. Eventually, Lindy made the painful decision to leave Alaska and hold a memorial service for Hale and New Orleans at the St. Louis Cathedral. We went outside, and there was a 21-gun salute. And as the first shot went off of the salute, it just sort of reverberated down my body. And I thought, how am I going to stand here for the rest of them when I cry? She was living here in this big suburban house all by herself. This house was virtually a shrine to Papa. His clothes were still in the closet five years after his death. And in many ways, she had yet to, to, to make the transition from being Mrs. Hale Boggs to being Lindy Boggs, to being her own person. And, and did you struggle with whether or not to run? I sort of found myself running, so much so that I went to Archbishop Hannon 
and said, shouldn't I have had this agonizing night of appraisal? And, you know, and, and as I said, his retort to me was, no, it's too natural. I can't imagine an occasion in which Hale would prefer to be than to be here tonight with all of the young people and their parents, their teachers. Here in the Irish Channel in New Orleans is probably the happiest St. Patrick's Day in the whole United States. It's just a great pleasure to be here with all of Hale's friends. It made all the sense in the world for her to run for the seat. She was knowledgeable, she was good at it, and it would be a continuation in her mind of uh, Daddy's work. Of course, what she discovered was that it was the beginning of her work. She went to Congress in March of 1973 and asked to go on the Banking and Currency Committee, and they created an extra seat on the committee for her. My mother found herself in the position that so many women did, which was that she had not only lost her spouse, she had lost her credit. And it was very, very difficult for women to establish credit. I hadn't been there very long before the bank women of D.C., Maryland, and Virginia came to see me. They were very disturbed about the credit laws, and. Uh, when the committee began to overhaul the banking laws that there couldn't be any discrimination because of age or veterans status. And so I ran into the side room and wrote a sex and marital status and uh, you know, put on my best Southern accent and distributed them to each of the members of the committee and said, knowing the composition of this committee, I'm sure this was just an oversight. So I discovered that Scarlett O'Hara was better than all of that training I'd had in legislation. And that's how equal credit for women got established. If a woman wants to receive a mortgage for a home, they now can get it. And back then, on that banking committee in those days, she was a lone voice. That was a hard struggle. When I first got to Congress, she had a chair waiting for me so I wouldn't be alone. And I sat right next to her, and she nudged me that first day when the chairman called. She said, darling, you got to stand up. I said, oh, all right. But I had a coach. I had somebody there who was helping me. And she was the founding mother of the Women's Caucus. I don't really know what gave her the idea to form a Women's Caucus, but she did it. So we would get a table in the House dining room to discuss programs and problems and maneuvers and, and so on. And um, it would scare the men to death. <laughs> what on earth are they cooking up over there? <laughs> she taught us a lot while she was here. She's a Southern lady, that's for sure. She was a very shrewd politician at the same time. And I remember some of Lindy's advice. For example, she would always say to us, know thy power, know thy power and use it. The power of the assignments that we had, the power of our constituents, and the power of our working together. She was part of a very important movement. For the first time in our history, there were enough women, about a dozen of them, who really, as an organized group, were making an impact. Part of what really happened to her in the same period was she became a feminist. And she would never call herself that, but she was part of a small but very determined group of women. And um, they uh, organized themselves, and they wanted to make sure that there was a woman at every table when important decisions were made. I've come to realize that committees are where my grandmother starred. Unlike my grandfather, she wasn't a fiery speaker on the big issues before the big crowds. 
The motto she's always lived by is that you can accomplish anything, as long as you don't need to take the credit yourself. My grandmother's specialty was getting money. She raised millions for the causes she championed. And she did this best behind the scenes, in the intimate setting of small committees. Here she wielded the skills and contacts she had honed so successfully as a political wife. As a member of uh, the Appropriations Committee, she was a strong advocate of the National Science Foundation and NASA, as well as the Energy Department's scientific programs. We were probably the two most liberal members of that subcommittee. Together we worked on setting up programs uh, with the National Science Foundation targeted towards the inclusion of minorities and women. As a member of the Energy and Water Subcommittee, she became more and more aware of the issues of wetlands losses. We were losing, at that point in time, 50 square miles of, uh, of wetlands a year because of subsidence. She started looking for solutions to the problem. Have you ever lost a vote on any of the issues that pertain to the Mississippi? I don't think so. Mama always was able to get things that she wanted uh, through committees. Uh, again, in indirect ways, she didn't need to take the credit, but she did want to get it done. And she pretty much didn't leave you alone until you did it. Well, first of all, nobody could say no to Lenny Box. It was easier to give in to her than to continue opposing her. <laughs> you couldn't say no to Lindy if you wanted to say no. It would be like saying no to Mother Teresa. I remember being in the elevator with the commandant of the Coast Guard and one of his deputies, and he didn't know who I was. And I heard him complain, you know, she took, she picked my pocket for $10 million. Certainly, if you'd said to any member of the leadership or committee chairman, is Lindy Boggs an operator? They would say, oh, no, no, no. Um, we rely on her, but she's not an operator, because operator is sort of a, um, a bad word. They, they thought she was wonderful, and she took them to the cleaners a lot while they thought she was wonderful. Well, I've said many times that Lenny Boggs would get more done in five seconds of whispering in Tip O'Neill's ear than I could in six months of lobbying him on the floor. Lindy had the great ability to just get really close down with Tip O'Neill and Tip would be nodding affirmatively and she'd walk down and the deal was done. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> she clearly tapped into and utilized one of the uh, traditional identities of the Old South, the Southern Lady, uh, if you like, the, uh, the steel magnolia. Lindy Boggs's persona was most effective with male legislators who responded to that role and uh, also perhaps were fooled by it, if I might say. <laughs> So would you call your mother-in-law a steel magnolia? I sure would. I think the term was invented for her. Um, none of us have ever, ever seen her cry, ever. I think it's partly because she feels that she has to be the strong one. But also, um, it's reflecting her determination. She's one of the most determined people I've ever met. Congress was the family business. Mom and I were both covering Congress. Mama was there as a member. Your Uncle Tommy was there as a lobbyist. She was sort of the matriarch of the whole family. There have been a number of family dynasties in American politics, the Adams, the Roosevelts, the Tafts, the Kennedys. Maybe we're looking at the beginning of a Boggs dynasty. Here's the candidate. All the grassroots here with me. Barbara Boggs Sigmund of Princeton, New Jersey. And here's the mother, Congresswoman Lindy Boggs of New Orleans. Wonderful day. Plantation manners and a shrewd politician. You've seen the way a political wife gazes adoringly at her husband. Now watch a political mother. What a thrill 
what a joy it is to a mother to sit here and listen to the dreams that her daughter has for the United States of America. This charming Southern woman with her steel grip and a velvet glove represents the best in the Democratic Party. I move her election as convention chair. Lindy Boggs is elected by acclamation chairperson of the 19... In 1976, my grandmother was the first woman ever to chair a national political convention. And then, of course, that 1976 convention uh, uh, came off uh, flawlessly. Uh, Jimmy Carter went on to uh, win the election, and I think you have to give uh, Lindy Boggs some credit for that. My election, I know, is a tribute to many women who have loved and worked long and diligently for the Democratic Party and helped to mold its principles. It's also a tribute to those vigorous leaders who have raised the sights of all Americans to what women can and will accomplish. One potential first generating much attention is the possibility this may be the year a woman runs for vice president. But who might these leading ladies be? On the Democratic side, there's Representative Geraldine Ferraro from New York, Louisiana Representative Lindy Boggs. It's simply an idea whose time has come. The most general comment that I hear is, well, it's about time. Mrs. Boggs, I've, I've seen it said that you um, don't know anybody you don't like. <laughs> Are you gritty enough to be a, a candidate for vice president? I, I think I've been shown that I'm gritty enough to live through many tough campaigns and to overcome a great many difficulties and uh, perhaps some shocks in life. And uh, I, I don't think that you have to dislike people in order to be strong. Lindy Boggs was a, a viable vice presidential contender. Few other women in uh, national politics that had the experience that she had had. But there was one thing standing in her way, and that was her opposition to abortion. You've always been pro-life on the abortion issue. Was it hard sometimes to be a female pro-life Democrat? It was difficult explaining uh, sometimes to, to the people who considered me a, quote, liberal, unquote, uh, on, on other issues. Um, I think being for life is very liberal. <laughs> How liberal can you get? <laughs> This is a terribly important issue. It's one that affects people regardless of their point of view. And I think being in the Women's Caucus and uh, new women being elected who took a view different than her own created tensions that marginalized her in a sense. Lindy Boggs, six terms in the House, never had much trouble winning before. But now the lines of her district have been changed. Boggs is running from the only majority black district in Louisiana. Louisiana black leaders had to go to court to get the majority black district. They say the logical next step is to elect a black congressman. Black leaders here say Mrs. Boggs will probably win today, not just because she spent more money, but because she has a lot of black friends. But they also say that if she runs again, they intend to be back, with more money on their side and a stronger candidate. No offense to Lindy, they say. She's been a good congressperson, but their time has come. Today, I'm announcing that this chapter in my service to the public is ending. After 17 and a half years, I will not stand for re-election to another term in the House of Representatives. I left the Congress. It was as much because I felt the district should be a black majority district. And, and of course, I really did want to be with Barbara for as long as I could. This mother, who lost her husband too soon, is now losing a child. 
Her daughter, Barbara, mayor of Princeton, New Jersey, is dying. She lost an eye to cancer. The disease has recurred. Barbara was so ill, and I knew she had a very short time to live. And uh, so I wanted to be able to be with her. I hated her decision to retire. Uh, I was very worried about her. Uh, my sister was dying, and I thought that she would leave the Congress and be at loose ends about what to do, and uh, that her support system was here. What did she say when you brought up those concerns? She said there is a time for every season. Uh, she basically quoted Ecclesiastes. Do you think it was important for her and for Barbara that she was there? She said, I can't hug Barbara from the Capitol. And um, I think it was very important to her. Lindy is without question the most devout Catholic woman that I have ever known. And it's quite unnatural to bury one's child, and she had to do that, and it was her deep faith that got her through those things. Uh, during the time of loss for Hale and later for Barbara, she found herself more often than not comforting those who had ostensibly come to comfort her. Several years after my Aunt Barbara's death, my grandmother was offered a new challenge. President Clinton asked her to become ambassador to the Vatican. So at the age of 81, she moved to Rome to start a new career as a foreign diplomat. And of course, um, what happened in this country happened. And I always joke that she was then um, given the hardest diplomatic assignment of all time, which was representing Bill Clinton to the Pope. After serving in Rome for several years, my grandmother finally returned home so to New Orleans. Years. And they're such good neighbors, hi. She moved back into an old house she had inherited from her aunt on Bourbon Street. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you. My grandmother gave retirement a whole new spin. She's incredibly active with a very busy social life and yet another full plate of causes and issues here in New Orleans. In return, she's been showered with accolades. And she says often that she counsels her friends not to retire. It's exhausting. Like my grandmother was 60 years ago, I'm now a mother of three young children, juggling career and family. In her own inimitable feminine style, Lindy has lived her life according to the values she learned in the convent so long ago. I hope I can follow in her footsteps. And one of the things that makes your grandmother really happy is for us to sing together. Sorry, I'll pitch it low, I promise. Okay. There's a long, long trail of winding into the land of my dreams, where the night and gale is singing and the pale moon beams. There's a long, long night of waiting until my dreams all come true till the day when I go walking down that long, long trail with you. <laughs> to obtain a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246.
major funding was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Edward Wisner Donation Fund. The Edward Wisner Donation through the City of New Orleans funds cultural, educational, environmental, and health-related nonprofits in Orleans Parish. And the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation. Whitney Bank. Bell South. The Gold Ring Family Foundation. The T.G. Solomon Families. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana. Louisiana State University. And by... We are PBS.